My name is Amy Reese, and I am the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Hirschberg Foundation. Aggie Hirschberg, our founder, is here too, and looks forward to saying hello at the end of the webinar. Please ask your questions either during or after the slide presentation by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Anand, a medical oncologist and hematologist at UCLA who practices in Santa Monica and Westlake Village. He is a generalist with a specialized interest in gastrointestinal cancers, including pancreatic. He also has an interest in the application of integrative oncology, which means approaching cancer care with traditional therapies, such as chemotherapy and immunotherapy, along with evidence-based integrative methods, including nutrition and exercise. He is also interested in technologies to help deliver higher quality care and access to clinical trials for patients. Thank you, Dr. Anand, for joining us. We appreciate you taking your time today to share this valuable information. Welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Amy and, and Aggie and um, Alyssa and the whole Hirschberg uh, Foundation, as well as everyone joining today. I really uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Not sure, Alyssa, I think I need to get access to share my screen. Sorry about that. You should be able to share your screen now. Perfect. All right. Okay. So if everyone can hear me and can see my slides, I will start. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, no uh, disclosures today, no off-label use of any um, medications that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and I just uh, left this cartoon in because I think it's, it's important actually, what, what I think this cartoon is sort of saying is it's actually important I find to challenge, um, challenge physicians. You know, we, we often see patients um, and, and welcome, you know, ideas that they have um, involvement very actively in, in plans of care. And it's, so I think um, to the credit of uh, foundations like Hirschberg and um, to all of you patients in terms of learning more about um, diseases and understanding where clinical trials come from and, and how to be more active and really coming up with strategies to get the, the best care possible. So my objectives today um, are really to give you a little bit of a, a background on trial design and research methods um, so that it's a building block for all of us to better understand um, how clinical trials come to be and some of the real nuances in, in, in what clinical trials uh, are really built upon and, and, and how you can really identify which trials may be appropriate for you. And then we'll talk about some potential search strategies, and then in brief, uh, some of the future directions of pancreatic cancer clinical trials. So we'll first get into a little bit about a background and then take you on a couple of other um, journeys through some building blocks uh, to understand clinical trials, and then talk a little bit about how you can prepare for uh, and navigate trial information and search on your own, and then some future directions. Just background, you know, clinical trials are systematic investigations uh, in human subjects to really evaluate the safety, uh, very importantly, and the efficacy of new clinical interventions. And this is any kind of clinical intervention. It doesn't have to be a drug. It can be a certain new surgical procedure. It could be a new diagnostic, um, even lifestyle changes. So interventions that involve um, diet and exercise, like we were talking about they can all be studied in this uh, clinical trial method um, to really come up with what is a better way of doing things than, than currently. Um, this is just a headline from a very recent um, publication on uh, Olaparib for uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer, for example. And the hope is really to get a new treatment for you as a patient and, to and for you to derive benefit. It's also, for some people, a way to contribute to research and help other patients, um, but always to keep in mind that these, these are also um, drugs and, or other procedures and, 
they can also have toxicities and they also can have also uh, possibly limited efficacy compared to standard treatments. Um, so I know there's a lot of hope uh, with clinical trials, but there can also be um, uh, uh, certain circumstances where the standard of care is actually uh, can be better. Just a brief, uh, I've, I've, I found this interesting coming up with preparing for this talk, uh, just the evolution of where clinical trials started. I saw some uh, documentation uh, about uh, one of the first clinical trials documented was a biblical uh, description of um, the diet change from meat, meat and wine versus, versus vegetables. And, um, and it was a first mention of something like that where you had a comparison group. And then there was a number of early, early, um, Clinical trials. Uh, one of the first that a physician ran, um, you know, when James Lind in the 1700s to look into how scurvy could be cured among sailors, um, and then in the 40s started to get these new concepts, which we'll go into about double-blind studies, controlled studies, um, and then in the 40s looking at other uh, techniques such as randomized controlled studies. Along with that evolution, though. We've learned a lot about the ethical considerations that go into clinical trials that are very important. Of course, all physicians um, from Hippocratic Oath in terms of um, approaching patients with, with their best interests in mind. Um, but actually, interestingly, the FDA was formed in the 1800s as a scientific body. Um, a lot of changes were, were take, took place with the First and Second World War in terms of uh, informed consent for subjects. In the 60s, that was expanded. And then in actually the, the 1970s, the Belmont report due to the Tuskegee experiments in patients with syphilis, African-American sharecroppers who weren't given appropriate informed consent changed a lot of things because we've learned about the, the very important ethical considerations of the trial. And then in the 90s, we came up with the good clinical practice standard approach to um, how we practice our trials. Um, so basically, when we think about um, clinical trials, just we think about research methods. Randomized clinical trials, really, we are uh, experimenting, trying to assigning an exposure, a drug or intervention, and, and then observing the outcome to that exposure. That's one type of study. There's actually many other types of studies. There's observational studies, which we just observe populations over time uh, and, and don't actually apply an intervention to. Most of the, tr the trials that you will be exposed to in pancreatic cancer will be the randomized clinical trial or variations thereof. And what's involved in that? So generally speaking, there's clinical centers. These are ac often academic centers like you know, large universities like UCLA and involved in recruiting participants, collecting data, administering the therapies. These also can be community sites in many uh, circumstances that are part of broader clinical trial networks. So not just universities, but any, really anywhere, there's opportunities uh, to be involved in clinical trials. There's laboratory um, involvement where there's data uh, processing and uh, some of the assays that are important and there's coordinating uh, activities. And then there's really the big uh, the data oversight components. So externally, there's something called the uh, internal, uh, in, sorry, the Institutional um, uh, Review Board and Data Safety Monitoring Board. Internally, there's also specific institutional uh, requirements, the sponsors, contract research organizations. So all of these entities are involved with oversight for all these trials, mainly because of the, some of the ethical considerations that we've uh, come to understand over time. That's a rough background, just over, overview of what, what goes into uh, trials. What I wanted to, to really um, do is uh, come up with a, a way for all of us to understand trials from really the the origin of them and really understand what com comes into the research methodology so we can really understand the nuances of trials we're looking for. So let's come up with a question. This might be an interesting way to learn. Uh, let's figure out, uh, because COVID is, is so um, such an obvious an issue right now, let's figure out a, a question that was raised um, because people noticed certain populations that had higher exposure to vitamin D uh, maybe had had a benefit in terms of COVID prevention. So let's actually take this question and come up with a trial together. Can vitamin D intake prevent COVID? So we're going to define the research question, identify the target population, design the core elements of the study, determine recruitment strategies, and analyze the data with this question. 
So when we design a research question, we come up with a hypothesis. Um, and we, we have to see if it's effective in terms of a study population and if it's effective in, in the real world, because um, they actually could be two different things. So in this, in this setting, we want to come up with a study to look at the efficacy and effectiveness of a certain amount of vitamin D on the rates of COVID infection in, in a high-risk population. Now, our hypothesis, and you might see this in terms of how trials are designed, it could be to demonstrate that vitamin D over no vitamin D, so vitamin D is better, or uh, sometimes equivalence, that, that giving uh, vitamin D is not inferior to giving something else. So there's two different types of approaches. It's not, sometimes they're called non-inferiority studies or comparative or, or studies that compare one, one thing over another. In this case, we hypothesize that vitamin D intake is correlated with a decrease in COVID infection that would be more like a comparative type of study. So let's find out the target population. This is a critical step in clinical trial design. We have to figure out the population that might benefit from this the most, who's at the highest risk perhaps for this disease or, or who might benefit from this intervention, who can be recruited and followed easily. And so in, in this setting, maybe uh, setting patients in assisted living facilities might be a, a great benefit to them because they might benefit from our intervention. But along with that, we have to really make sure the study, this kind of study is safe for that population and that we're doing something that would make the most sense. And, and so this is really where enrollment criteria come in. So this is, we'll, some, we'll talk about this in the pancreatic cancer world, but for our study, uh, in our inclusion criteria, we might define an age group. Um, we might define that these patients should live in assisted living facilities and not have a previous COVID diagnosis to get the really the most relevant information. And in terms of safety, we have to think about, you know, does vitamin D affect people differently if you have existing kidney disease or liver disease? So um, are, 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 the, are those are safety issues, but we have to define those things before we start enrolling patients onto this clinical trial, because we want to make sure our intervention is safe for that population. And then we design the core elements of the study. So this, um, this is really, uh, mainly in terms of the, the parallel or crossover design. Um, if you can think about it, if you have an intervention of vitamin D or no vitamin D, if we start to notice that vitamin D is better for our uh, cohort of patients, then studies sometimes uh, are stopped early or and then offered to the broader population of patients. Or then sometimes there's a crossover design that both groups get that intervention eventually. Um, we tend to randomize, which means we, we, we we don't um, select only one group because we we actually could uh, um, have some bias along those lines and say you know we're just going to give healthy patients the vitamin D and that and then of course our results would be skewed. So the purpose of randomization is that we don't know which group's getting vitamin D, so we can't influence the results. And same thing with uh, reducing any kind of sort of confounding from other variables. And that's where blinding comes in, where we we don't know as an experimental team, and then also the patients don't know. So often in these studies, they're really the, some of the best way, because there is somewhat of an effect sometimes when patients do know um, in terms of clients and things like that. So it's better if, in terms of a double blind study that no, nobody knows who received the intervention until after the study is over. Um, and some of this we'll get into with regard to how you re we reduce the types of errors that can doing these trials. A lot of the elements that come into trial design involve trying to maximize the, the ability to, to um, come up with a strategy to reduce, uh, reduce bias. And then we're going to come up with a way to recruit our patients. So how do we find these patients? Um, oftentimes this involves um, publishing uh, mailings. You'll see things on the media. Uh, clinical trial registries, um, often uh, physicians will be aware of these types of trials. So all of these things will come into to play when we are coming up with a way to market our study. And um, this I found on the, the web, there's a new trial uh, registry for, for patients interested in, in COVID. And then we, once we have our trial run, we will look at our data. There's a number of elements that come into how we analyze data from trials that uh, physicians get involved with and often argue with uh, in, our, in our national meetings about really what is the, the benefit to this intervention. We look at 
um, different statistical methods. We look at um, uh, important issues. If there's patients who have dropped out of trials, we have different statistical methods to, to uh, even if to, to accommodate for that. There's a concept called statistical versus clinical significance. So you might hear on the news about a very interesting trial that was statistically not significant, which meant that it didn't meet its endpoints uh, for that clinical trial. But uh, doctors and, and, and the authors of the study are still optimistic about that intervention because there might be a clinical implication even from the trend in that trial. Um, it's also important to understand negative results from trials, not just positive results. And like we were talking about, what's effective in the trial may not be um, as similar to the, the general population. And that's really what effectiveness is. And we need to, that's why we study things even after clinical trials to see how they're working for patients. So that's a little bit about research methodology. Um, so we came up with a, a trial designed for vitamin D um, and I hope that sheds light on some of the things we think about when designing clinical trials. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about overview of clinical trials in general before getting into a little bit about navigating the trial lab. So the drug review steps. So there's a preclinical phase. This is when doctors and scientists are in the laboratory studying uh, compounds and screening new compounds to see what might be beneficial for patients. Um, based on those studies, we often file what's called an investigational new drug application to study those things in humans. And the part where we start to study those things in humans is the clinical phase, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. Um, and once we get through phase three trials with data that might be beneficial to patients, we seek a new drug application for the FDA. And the FDA, if they approve our, uh, our drug, uh, we can then market that drug for our population of patients. After that period, there's uh, phase four studies, which are post-marketing studies. So even after the drug's approved and on the market, we can understand how that drug is doing in our population, understand safety implications that are long. So the preclinical phase really is to understand all of the, the nuances of how that chemistry is working in the, in, the, in, the, in the models in tissue culture and in mice models to understand toxicities, to understand uh, what the, what's called a therapeutic index to look at how it's affecting uh, these um, non-human models. Um, and then to file a initial drug application if these, if these studies show that there is some efficacy and safety. And this is evaluated. There's a lot that goes into making sure that there's uh, enough safety data, that there's a, a lot of ethical considerations that come into these things. So there's a lot of work that goes into preclinical studies before they hit the clinical phases. And we'll talk a little bit about what these are, but um, it's, in, uh, it's a good overview. Uh, there's, there's basically the phase zero, which is somewhat new, newer concept to understand drug metabolism. Phase one, safety and dosing, really. Uh, phase two, which is the drug effectiveness and safety. Phase three, which are larger numbers and we can actually confirm safety and compare uh, medications with one another, for example and then the post-market surveillance once they're actually approved. So phase zero, this is basically we've gone through the preclinical or the, the laboratory work in the non-human model. Um, the reason why phase zero came, in, came into play was that there was a, a sort of a slow approval process that was taking place for drugs. Um, so the FDA created this mechanism to start with uh, uh, the concept of microdosing, very low dose test testing with a very small number of patients and not to look at outcomes, but actually just to look at pharmacokinetics, those, those um, ideas around how much of the drug levels obtained in the blood and things, are, things like that. Most patients aren't necessarily exposed to phase zero trials, so I'll, I won't talk too much about this. But phase one, you'll commonly see, these are um, trials with a small number of patients. Um, they're run on a fairly um, uh, quick time frame, and they're really around safety and drug dosing. It's around understanding how the drugs are distributed through the body and absorbed, um, how available they are if they're an oral drug, how, how much your, your gut can absorb this drug, and then what uh, the tolerated dose is. So there's a concept where in these trials, often the doctors will, will start to escalate dosing to understand toxicities. Um, 
And uh, these studies tend to be single arm, which means that everyone in the study group gets the drug. Um, but this is really about dose finding. And uh, um, there's not a lot of understanding in these. Sometimes there are about efficacy, um, but there can be a lot of information gleaned about toxicities. One example uh, of uh, information that can be beneficial, such as in uh, Limparza, um, is impacts on uh, bioavailability, such as uh, grapefruit juice, uh, which can inhibit this enzyme, the CYP3A4 enzyme, so that it's less bioavailable. Uh, or sorry, it's, that it's actually more, bio, more bioavailable. And similar um, interactions with drugs and uh, other drugs, as well as um, uh, therapeutic levels in the blood. Phase two gets into uh, efficacy, and this is a therapeutic um, trial to really confirm the uh, effectiveness, monitor side effects, further evaluate safety. Um, there's um, 2A studies, 2B studies that, that differ somewhat. Uh, 2A tend to be just single center studies that compare with the standard of care. Um, but this is really where we start to get into where this drug effect for the population. Most of these studies are also uh, tend to be single arm, which means everyone on the study gets it. And then phase three, which is uh, can be a larger number of patients and uh, a longer time frame, and this is really to confirm how is this drug or intervention comparing against the standard of care, and uh, it's where we can collect additional safety data and we can really get this information to get to our NDA new drug application. Um, sometimes now in phase two, we're actually getting to new drug applications out of phase two trials due to some of the changes the FDA uh, has made. So this is a, a nice graphic um, from this group, um, but essentially it covers our, um, our, what we've talked about so far. So there's a, a large preclinical component of laboratory testing, uh, animal testing, uh, confirming those models, uh, dose finding in phase one studies uh, with a small group of patients, phase two studies, which are looking at a, a, making sure our proof of concept is there and, and that this is actually beneficial for, for our patients, and then really comparing with standard of care in phase three trials. This then leads to uh, compelling results, hopefully, and then uh, approval uh, and then after approval to continually test and understand how this is playing out in the population using the phase four study. As you can imagine, this is takes, it takes a long time and a lot of money to get drugs from drug discovery all the way to the component where the FDA is approving a drug. A lot of time and a lot of effort from a lot of patients who are involved and, and the physicians who are helping take care of them. Um, so it's, there's, uh, I wanted you to understand there's a funnel, there's a lot of compounds being screened to get to the, the component where we're actually studying them in humans. Some of the changes the FDA made uh, to get drugs out quicker um, because of some of the delays in, in, in approval in the, in the past um, so in the 90s, I uh, started to think about this concept of accelerated approval. Um, looking at surrogate endpoints as opposed to some outcomes, which may take a lot longer to study. Fast tracking uh, certain medications that might be needed in, in very serious conditions, such as pancreatic cancer. Um, prior, priority review, so the FDA goal to really act on these applications really quickly. Breakthrough designation, so expediting the development and review of drugs that really are just demonstrating substantial improvement. This happened really with the immunotherapy revolution. And then this new concept of real-time oncology review pilot, which is this new idea of facilitating much earlier review of trial data for higher potential drugs and, and coming up with trial design around that uh, concept. The good news is that there's a lot of new drugs in oncology that are being approved every year because of these changes. Um, and we look in the 2018, just compared to even the early 2000s, and then 2019, 57 anti-cancer medicines approved by the FDA and the European Medical Association, 16 of which were IO immunotherapy related, seven chemotherapy related, and 33 small molecule, which are what we call targeted therapy. So it's really an encouraging uh, trend um, with, with a lot of hope. And I just wanted to show you this data that there's a lot more 
um, drugs ought to be starting to be approved out of phase, even phase two trials, um, which is an interesting development, um, and especially with promising, uh, promising medication. All right, so now we talked a little bit about research methodology and, and coming up with the vitamin D trial. We are, we are now uh, equipped to understand what different phases are of clinical trials. Now we're going to uh, go and see what is really needed for us to navigate these trials for ourselves and prepare for that search. So things to know. Uh, most importantly, always understand this is an informed consent for these clinical trials. Uh, so you can voluntarily confirm your willingness to participate in a particular trial after being informed of all aspects of the trial relevant to your decision to participate. It's not obligate that you ever remain in the clinical trial. You can drop out at any time without any explanation. That's what it really the, the benefit of all these ethical um, evolution over time, what informed consent is all about. Really, it's good, based on what we were talking about earlier, it's really good to understand what is really the difference. So a single arm trial, those phase one and phase two trials we studied about, uh, study, or we talked about, they're non-randomized. That means everyone in the trial receives uh, the experimental therapy. Um, and, uh, and it's good to understand phase one is dose finding. We don't know exactly the therapeutic window necessarily between toxicity and benefit, but there are also a lot of promising compounds being studied in phase one and, and new techniques. Phase two, where there's actually efficacy being studied, um, and knowing those nuances. And then if there's a, a double arm or randomized trial, such as a phase three trial, um, and sometimes there's randomized phase two trial where there might be a placebo um, with standard of care. So understanding these nuances and, and asking your doctor um, to explain these is, is important. So for example, in the pancreatic cancer world, the differences between a trial that may be looking at Fulfirinox, which is a chemotherapy regimen given after surgery with a placebo versus, um, versus an adjuvant Fulfirinox plus our drug, for example. So then you might know being on that trial, you'd get standard of care, which is Fulfirinox, but you may or may not get the, the drug of interest. Um, but, and then knowing that actually gemcitabine and Zolota is is um, we know that fulfirinox is better than gemcitabine and zolota in terms of adjuvant treatment based on the trial. So if the trial involves gemcitabine and zolota in the adjuvant setting after surgery, that means, then you might question, uh, should I be on this trial unless there's certain other reasons because that uh, performance status and other things. And then maybe it's a single arm study with some of these medications plus experimental treatments. And what does that mean uh, if, it's, if it's a certain uh, drug backbone? And you might ask these types of questions. And then more pertinent to your life and um, what's happening with your disease, location of the trial. So is this somewhere that's convenient for me? Um, is it going to be uh, something that is open when I need it to be open? Um, there's something called a washout period, which means that I received uh, therapy, chemotherapy, or radiation in the, in the last few weeks, for example. If the, if the washout period means that it's, it's going to be a longer time period than, than, is, than I think would be needed, and your doctor would talk to you about that. And then how long is the study going to be going to be run? And then really importantly to understand eligibility, we were talking a little bit about this when we were designing our vitamin D trial, but what, what is the, the um, what is going to be the possibilities of this drug being toxic? So we got to know how our organ function is renal function, liver function, um, if I'm an active person who can participate in clinical trials, um, all of these things have been linked to, to tolerating these new medications or interventions better. Um, have I had, and then some of the things that come up with these trials is, have you had other cancers uh, recently, which sometimes excludes people from trials? Um, some people want to know if a new tissue biopsy is required, which can happen sometimes. Um, also, that additional therapies for such as radiation may not be allowed during uh, during this clinical trial. And then often these trials, uh, when they're designed, they want to know how many lines of treatment this patient has had. So what chemotherapy regimens you've already gone through um, might inform which trials you're actually eligible. So when we prepare for our search, this was the one slide I wanted to highlight. The most important things to understand are 
really what type of cancer you have in terms of the pancreatic cancers, the pancreatic adenocarcinomas um, being most common, uh, but also you know understanding other subtypes. For example, if it's a neuroendocrine tumor, that might be a different um, set of trials. Um, the stage of the cancer. So are we looking at uh, a cancer that was after a surgical resection? Is it a, a cancer that's locally advanced and not resectable? You'll, you'll hear us talk about. Is it a cancer that has been metastatic? And if it's metastatic, where are the locations in your body? Um, that's important to note. And like we were talking about, what treatments have you received? So how, what chemotherapy you may, may have gotten? What radiation? When was your surgery? Those are all important. And then kind of what we were alluding to with our vitamin D uh, experiment um, is to understand, make sure this is not toxic to us. What is our bone marrow function. How, how are our white blood cells, our red blood cells, our platelets from all of our previous treatment we may have had? Can we handle this new treatment? What's our liver function? What's our kidney function? So if you're able to keep track of these things, it might help with the search. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about standard of care um, because I think this is important. It's good to know what you're comparing being on a clinical trial to in terms of standard of care to make sure you know that you're getting standard of care plus. And then with the pancreatic cancer world especially, um, it might help to know if you've had next generation sequencing, which are companies such as, um, there's a whole list of them, but companies such as Foundation Medicine and Tempest, and there's a whole list of them. Uh, but uh, your doctor may have run sequencing on your tumor to uh, come up with um, possible additional drug targets. And this information might be helpful. And actually those reports actually list sometimes clinical trials that are relevant to your specific mutation. So if you don't have a copy of those, you can ask your doctor for that, especially in pancreatic cancer where this is often covered by insurance in the metastatic setting especially. So just briefly about standard of care, um, uh, quickly, but the way we look at pancreatic cancer, uh, we look at groups. Um, is there, is it, there's a certain number of patients who our earlier stage who have resectable pancreatic cancer. We have a borderline resectable uh, group where we worry, the surgeons uh, worry about um, involvement of particular arteries uh, that make, make resection more difficult. Locally advanced where they're not resectable and metastatic uh, disease where it's spread outside of the, the pancreas. And understanding stage is important, but it's really these groups, including the stage that really define what therapies are in terms of our resectable pancreatic cancer, um, we've learned a few things uh, that upfront surgical resection is, is generally the approach. Um, these are a number of studies that have been run since the 80s, um, in different evolution of what, what our approach has been. Um, we've studied various chemotherapy agents after surgery to see if there's a benefit to patients. Um, earlier on, it was just gemcitabine, a medication that we used. It's a chemotherapy infusion. This was advanced with gemcitabine plus capecitabine, which is an oral chemotherapy agent. Uh, we found that out with data in 2017. And then the evolution 2018 with that trial we showed a banner of in the beginning that uh, a medication regimen called modified fulfirinox, which are three chemotherapies, uh, different uh, with something called 5-FU, irinotecan, and exaliplatin is better than gemcitabine. Um, and then the involvement in radiation um, has not necessarily demonstrated any survival benefit after this surgical resection, but there may be uh, opportunities where that's used as well in, in complication with multiple scenarios. Um, in terms of the locally advanced um, uh, group, in terms of staging, we've um, studied chemo and radiation together, it's followed by chemotherapy. We've studied induction chemotherapy, starting with chemotherapy and then chemo radiation. We then moved on to just um, sorry, that should be 16, but systemic therapy alone um, with various chemo regimens. And then we're, we're learning a little bit about systemic therapy possibly being added with chemotherapy and radiation, which improves something called progression-free survival. And we use something called capecitabine. So um, just understanding the, the grouping. Um, finally, with the metastatic pancreatic cancer, Group, we have two different um, approaches generally with chemotherapy. We use something called gemcitabine and abraxane. If patients are really in good shape uh, to tolerate treatment, we use something called fulfirinox, which we talked about. 
Um, we've looked at a lot of agents over time in this group to see if there's other things we can add to chemotherapy. These are clinical trials being, that were run in a lot of different agents that we use in different other cancers. The one approval that was uh, obtained in 2005 was for erlotinib, which is a, a drug often used in um, lung cancer, and erlotinib, it, it, it gave a very small benefit, so it's not used that commonly, but it was still FDA approved. And the most recent and promising data in the BRCA positive population of patients in the metastatic setting, which means the cancer spread outside the pancreas, was something called olaparib or Lymparza, where after patients get chemotherapy for metastatic pancreatic cancer, they can be on this medicine as a maintenance uh, therapy if they're re responding to the first line of uh, chemotherapy. And then of course, along with all of these um, interventions, it's important to keep in mind supportive care is always paramount going through all this, including psychosocial support, um, pain control, um, use of opioids or nerve blocks, um, understanding there's some data on thromboembolism, prophylaxis, uh, appetite stimulation, um, relieving things that come up, ascites, which is fluid in the belly, uh, jaundice, of course, and all of these things. And there might be clinical trials that involve the supportive elements to pancreatic cancer. So uh, once we are armed with all of the information we have about our cancer, uh, we understand what type of cancer we have, what treatment uh, lines we've gone through, what stage we're, we're, we are. We can go and search on our own. We can look at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, for example, has a great search tool. They actually have some advocacy groups have patient navigators that can help uh, navigate all this if you provide just some general information about your tumor. The National Clinical Trials Network also has information. Um, clinicaltrials.gov has a lot of information. It's just not easy to navigate. So, um, but if you're armed with all the information we talked about, you can get to the information that you're looking for. A lot of academic centers, universities will have their own websites that feature clinical trials. And of course, always ask your physician. Um, your physician not only will know what trials are there that are available to you at the location you're getting treated, but what might be offered at nearby um, settings. And I, we often get calls or emails from doctors, uh, you know, in the community that, that don't practice at UCLA to identify, find out if there's trials for their patients. So there's a network of doctors talking to each other. And of course, we can conduct these types of searches for our patients to look into trials and in other locations if you're interested. To contact these trial, um, uh, trial investigators, uh, there's usually a coordinator or a phone number that's uh, there as general information. Um, you can ask your, your, your uh, treatment team, your physician to reach out to those coordinators also, or even sometimes directly to those investigators if there's a question about your eligibility. All right, and so let's quickly touch on future directions for pancreatic cancer and then we'll get to some questions. So um, one of the, 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 so the trends in these therapeutic uh, approaches, um, there's been a lot of progress in different subtypes of cancer where we've, we've done what's called high throughput screening. We've screened hundreds of thousands of compounds looking for activity uh, in, in, with, with certain different types of medication. And, um, and then a funnel of which drugs show activity will then lead to our uh, other preclinical studies and then phases of, of human trials. Some of the challenges we faced in pancreatic cancer is that um, pancreatic cancer is often surrounded by a lot of what are called stromal cells or supportive cells. So it, sometimes it makes uh, tumor microenvironment uh, insensitive to some of these compounds. So we're trying to get around that by coming up with studies in preclinical models that involve uh, human cell lines and looking at um, uh, chemosensitivity or other drug sensitivity. The idea of biobanking, so there's some clinical uh, trial work where we're keeping human specimens to be able to run these types of studies. Um, some interesting uh, new technologies such as functional imaging to look at real time how patients are responding to these, these uh, interventions. Um, we, we are looking into incorporation of other uh, modalities such as surgery, how surgery can play a role in, in various uh, areas uh, in, in the, in the for example, the locally advanced setting, 
Um, there's a trial I'm involved with uh, that's coming out at UCLA called the Direct Nano Knife Study in a locally advanced population to look at uh, using small electrical currents to create pores in the cancer uh, cells to make them uh, those trigger cell death and also make them more amenable to chemotherapy. Um, so involving other disciplines besides just medical uh, intervention, uh, and, uh, pharmacology interventions, for example. Immunotherapies, uh, you know, been studied, uh, not a, a lot of promise yet, but there's still a lot of hope around that. Identifying biomarkers, so looking for signatures and sequencing. So when we look at a tumor and we send it out for sequencing, they're looking at the DNA of the tumor to look for different mutations that might be targetable. Uh, so the tumor's um, DNA, uh, the reason why it's grown is it's, it's achieved some sort of a survival advantage compared to other cells. Understanding what's driving that survival advantage might be something we could target. And then there's interesting ways of study designs, like we were talking about, some of these phase two studies are leading to drug approvals. And that's a, new, a newer uh, mechanism. Um, just overall, uh, there's something called the hallmarks of cancer that, that are uh, where we've um, begun to take advantage of, uh, of their mechanisms to be able to lead to cell death. Um, there's this concept of proliferative signaling that they evade um, uh, our body's way of suppressing their growth. Uh, they're able to invade and metastasize into other areas, which means they spread. Um, they, can, uh, they develop this immortality um, and they develop a way called angiogenesis of, of developing blood cells. Uh, to, to get to feed their growth, um, and they resist cell death by the immune system, for example. Um, and so we've tried to understand how cancer cells are taking advantage of these mechanisms to, to grow in order to try to stop their growth. So we've come up with various uh, interventions around these concepts um, and uh, for different types of cancers. Um, and you'll see the PARP inhibitors towards the left. This is taking advantage of um, a concept of gene instability to, to, and this has worked in pancreatic cancer. Um, and so there's a lot of hope uh, that we can still take advantage of these mechanisms uh, to come up with new therapeutic methodologies. Just a brief uh, about the pancreatic cancers at UC, uh, trials at UCLA and uh, a lot of our um, work, our primary investigators are uh, Dr. Zev Weinberg and Lee Rosen. Um, and so uh, I encourage if anyone's a UCLA patient interested in learning about these trials, we can link you up with the either trial group. Um, again, understanding what's in, in which group you're, you're, you're in. Uh, so if it's a locally advanced or metastatic setting, there's a number of trials. We just opened a trial uh, looking at um, something called NIP Ipsen study, looking at a, a specific chemotherapy regimen. Um, there's a lot, if those aren't available um, for various reasons, if you go through the eligibility criteria, then you sometimes look at the phase one studies, and, th and those are there as well. I mentioned the direct study that I'm involved with regarding uh, nano knife technology. And then I just did my own search um, using the uh, PanCan uh, search tool, which is great. Um, and what happens uh, when you just do a general search is you'll get a list of trials by phases. And so it might be a little overwhelming to just look at a list like this, but keep in mind um, you know, the, the things we talked about when you navigate this is to understand, of course, location, uh, you know, where, where you're, you're, you're okay. LA is a very big place, so where you're okay driving to. Uh, trials often involve a lot of um, uh, travel to trial destination to get studies um, initially in the first few weeks especially um, and then sometimes spread out to every two or three weeks depending on the study. So keep the location in mind. Uh, keep in mind what phase of study is being reported. So again we talked about phase one studies as being dose finding studies but of course relevant to some patients who if you may have um, uh, progressed through standard of care that this is a really good option because there's a lot of very interesting studies. And as you can see, some of these studies aren't specific to pancreatic cancer. Some of them are all solid tumors. Um, and so it's not just pancreatic cancer being studied. It's really the, the ability to study these things in multiple malignancies to see if there's a benefit. Phase two studies, these are efficacy studies. 
this example on the top of the list, for example, with being this new target called Claudin in the metastatic setting, along with um, uh, backbone of chemotherapy, um, phase two studies, again, being those that can show benefit as well as um, safety uh, and will be usually tumor specific. Um, and then phase three studies, which is really the gold standard in terms of randomized design, looking at uh, randomization, uh, for example, in this study with locally advanced unresectable pancreatic cancer uh, using chemotherapy and other agents, um, looking at uh, other combinations with full, modified fulfirinox with new drug, uh, for example, and, uh, and these new newer agents. So again, location, phase of trial, that'll help you narrow things down uh, a little bit when you're doing your own search. And then when you click on these various trials, you'll start to see those eligibility criteria. So you can sometimes match and see if you meet those criteria. Uh, have you had multiple lines of chemotherapy? How is your organ function? Um, and that might help you navigate uh, these various things. All right, so just to review, I wanted to give you a little bit about a background on trial design and research methods. The building block to help you understand clinical trials, uh, give you the information needed uh, which trials might be appropriate, um, and then uh, identify search strategies that might be useful, discuss in brief some of the future directions of these clinical trials. Just to review, remember, important to understand your cancer, your type of cancer, next generation sequencing, if you have it, you can ask your doctor for those reports, a stage of your cancer, previous lines of treatment. Uh, in terms of approaching search, you can use existing web tools like ANCAN network, ct.gov, um, and then ask your doctor for help. And, uh, and, and also advocacy groups are very important. Hirschberg is, as well, and um, PANCAN Network. Um, and then look for, once you're able to start your search, really look at what's relevant to you. So location, if that's important. Trial design, the phase of study being very important. Um, what, what's the current standard of care? I'd like you to ask your doctor what would be standard of care versus this clinical trial. Uh, understand what eligibility criteria are important, um, and then obviously the timing of when these things are open if there's slots available. All right, and I'll stop there and we can get into some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand. That was so helpful and educational. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can um, type them in the chat or just speak, speak and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Dr. Anand, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, great. Um, there's a question that says, so often pancreatic cancer is only discovered when very far advanced. Why? Uh, are there no markers for early stage pancreatic cancer? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, one of the ways that we identify pancreatic cancers through symptoms. And it's often a very insidious presentation. Um, the pancreatic uh, pancreas sits in a, in a fashion where it looks uh, almost like a, a fish with a head and a tail. And often the pancreatic cancers that start towards the middle or end of the tail don't cause what are called obstruction. It doesn't cause any invasion into surrounding structures. So you may not feel anything as that cancer is growing, whereas the head, um, the pancreas can cause what are called biliary tract obstruction or obstruction of the bile ducts and cause fundus. But again, very late, like you're mentioning, uh, and you don't notice that until someone becomes jaundice. So um, there's interesting, uh, th this is something people are looking at very aggressively. Um, there are certain familial syndromes that are uh, um, related to a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer where it may make sense to of imaging as surveillance. Um, there are certain types of uh, gene mutations, such as the BRCA families of genes, um, different populations where they're looking at MRIs, for example, to surveil, to catch these things earlier. Um, it doesn't, hasn't panned out to make sense in the broader populations, so they're really looking at subgroups that might benefit. And then there's some, some new data on something called cell-free DNA. And this is something I think over the next five to 10 years that's gonna be really, really interesting where they're actually looking at uh, your blood and seeing if there's uh, DNA cells that are malignant DNA cells. 
Um, right now, we're using ctDNA uh, in terms of monitoring response to tr treatment. Um, I'm actually involved in a trial here for colon cancer around those lines. But in, in the future, it's going to be looked at as a possibly a diagnostic marker. Uh, Google's looking into this, actually. There's a company called Grail um, that was founded also to look at ctDNA as a, as a marker. For but at the moment, uh, to your point, it's very difficult to catch early. There is some surveillance in high-risk population that's being done, but not in the broader population. Um, and and any of you can unmute if you'd like and ask a question. Um, part of uh, Michael's question is also, so is jaundice not always associated with pancreatic cancer, depending on where the lesion is situated on the pancreas? Right. Yeah, Michael, thanks for your question. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes it depends on the location if, if someone's going to experience jaundice as opposed to um, pain as maybe a first presentation. May I ask a question? <laughs> At what stage in patient care uh, does clinical trial uh, offering or recommendation comes in? That's a good good question, Maggie. And actually, I, I think it's it's I think it's great in in terms of the um, broad perspective in, in pancreatic cancer now that really any stage there could be a trial that's relevant to a patient. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's especially important, I think, in the metastatic uh, setting to keep in mind that there's a lot of trials that involve standard of care and additional uh, in, in investigations that are, that are good. But even in, in the, the local, locally advanced population, for example, the trial that I'm involved with at UCLA is in a locally advanced uh, population. And even in the, um, the post-surgical uh, population, that's how a lot of the innovations we came up with to learn that fulfirinox is better than existing uh, gemcitabine. That was uh, all done through a clinical trial. So really any stage, it's important to keep in mind. Anybody else? I think, I think everybody's uh, is, is quiet. And I, I'll, okay, I have one more question. Uh, for you personally, at what stage of a clinical trial you get excited? Uh, you mean if, if I'm excited about the trial itself? The results. Oh, Please. the results. That's a good question. You know, I, I think, um, I think phase two studies, um, to me, because of the demonstration of efficacy, I, I, I think in populations where there's, there's, uh, we need more options, I think we should get excited even when there's good phase two data that's being produced. Okay. Is it, it looks like there are no more questions. Are everybody positive? Everybody happy? <laughs> did we learn everything we wanted to? Did we hear everything and learn everything we wanted to hear? I did. I mean, I kept writing questions, and of course, you answered my question in, in 30 seconds later. So, okay. <laughs> um, so on behalf of everybody that attended, I really want to thank you for for this presentation. It was very, very informative, and thank you so much for your time. I know you guys are all crazy busy. So uh, I thank you for, for your time. Of course. Thank you, Aggie. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the sponsors. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Oh, go ahead, Alyssa. We yeah. have some more questions. So I think people started speaking up in the comments. Um, so from Michael asked, what kind of significance must be reached before stopping a clinical trial? Um, so I will yeah, good question, Michael. There's, it's, um, there's pre-specified endpoints to clinical trials. So um, there are certain trials where they'll look at uh, uh, data earlier on before those endpoints are reached. Um, they, there might be a little bit of a loss of statistical significance by doing that sometimes, but there are trials designed that way where you look earlier at data. Um, and the, sometimes those trials, because of the benefit it's showing, are are stopped early, but typically there's a, a statistical significance that's a defined threshold that's, that's, that's set up ahead of time um, that's related both to um, how 
what the intervention is, but also how big the population that's being studied is so that you can take that example. And so all those things are statistical methods. Can you read the second question as well? Yeah, yes. Dr. Anand is muted right now. Okay. Oh, there we go. No. Sorry. I you unmuted go. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the second question is from Chris. It says, my, my pancreatic cancer was found after I had a CT scan for colitis in the ER. I had been pre-diabetic since 2012 and complaining about back pain. Um, and he, they're wondering if there is research into improving diabetic screening. Great question. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know um, offhand of any specific studies, but uh, there, there is an increased incidence in uh, patients with diabetes and metabolic syndrome. So I think it's a very good point. And I hope we do come up with a way of, of screening diabetic patients better um, so that we get an earlier diagnosis, because you're absolutely right. That's an important population to study. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciated. Of course, anytime. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you everyone. so much. And then it says that there is more information about our next Zoom webinar. Our next Zoom webinar is actually going to be July 31st, um, which is again a Friday and it will be at 1 p.m. Um, and that will be with Dr. Isakov. Um, and if you go to pancreatic.org, you can sign up to receive our emails and we will send out more information, a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as information on future webinars. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you again. Of course.